We're going to get close. We're going to finish it next week, all right? Hebrews chapter 12, continuing our study through Hebrews. And I think this is about lesson 36. So we have been in this for quite some time, and that's okay. And uh, we want to look tonight at uh, a few verses, and we'll get down to verse 24. And like I said, we'll finish it up next week. Uh, I want to look at the thought of uh, where we have come, uh, where we have come. Uh, isn't it amazing the change that God makes in your life when you get saved? And you can look back and see where you used to be and where you are now and be so thankful uh, for where God has brought you. Uh, and, of course, you're at a point now in your Christian life where you, you understand you're living for Christ now, but this is still just temporary. And uh, what you're really looking forward to is, is heaven. We sang about it earlier. And uh, just looking forward to the day we get to see Jesus face to face and uh, reunite with loved ones and all those types of things. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, uh, we're going to pick up verse number 18 uh, tonight. And like I said, we'll read down through verse number 24. Uh, one thing I have noticed, and if you have um, been even somewhat into sharing the gospel or trying to share the gospel with people, one thing I have noticed as of late is there are not a lot of people interested in heaven anymore. They either don't believe in it or they don't care if they go. Uh, you hear all those kinds of things. And, and a lot of this, I think, boils down to the, the fact that some people have it so good... What do they need God or heaven for? Everything in my life's great, right? And so you, you, you deal with that now in the day and age in which we live. And, of course, it's much worse, I think, now than it used to be 40, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, but it's, it's getting to that point. And as we grow older, what we understand as Christians is this. Every day we get older, heaven becomes a little bit more precious. Because it seems like every day we get a little bit older, we lose another loved one. We lose another friend, we lose another relative, we uh, lose another church member. Uh, and, and so heaven is just like, you know, you, you hear the phrase, it's kind of become cliche, you know, heaven's getting sweeter all the time. But as we get older, we, we really understand what that means and, and how true that statement really is. Uh, some of us uh, have very dear folks that have been taken to heaven from us recently. Uh, we have those that are in heaven. And so to us, heaven has become even more important. And heaven has become even more of one of those places we long to go to and can't wait for the Lord to return to take us home. Uh, there's going to be a time, uh, and as we get older, I think we, we start to understand this, where material things mean less and less. And the things of this world mean, mean less and less. Uh, and there are money, many things that uh, money can buy, uh, but one thing we know it cannot buy is eternity. Uh, and as we as Christians have realized where God has brought us and still where he's going to take us to, uh, eternity comes into view in a little bit different light. Uh, and we're thankful for heaven. And, and uh, in verse number, uh, as we read this, we're going to look at, uh, again, 18 through 24. And as we start, you're going to see a contrast between 18 and uh, verse 18 and verse number 22, which we'll show you here in just a minute. Uh, two mountains are compared to in this passage of Scripture. You might think, what does that have to do with anything? We'll, we'll show you all this, kind of explain a little bit. But uh, Mount Sinai is talked about. That's a physical mountain. That's a mountain that exists that you could go to today. It's a mountain that's written about and recorded for us in Scripture. That's a physical location. Uh, and then Mount Zion is also mentioned. Uh, this is a spiritual destination for those that have been born again. Uh, this, is, this is a reference in, in, into heaven and where we're heading uh, when Christ calls us home. So you'll see those comparisons made in a couple of these verses. So as we think about this topic in Hebrews uh, chapter 12, let's pick up verse number 18. And we'll read down through verse number 22 and then get into our, our first point in our outline. Everybody get an outline that, that wanted one? They're on the visitor center if you didn't get one. We'll make sure that you got one. Everybody good? All right, look at verse number 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. That's, of course, it's a reference to, uh, to Mount Sinai. Uh, and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the words should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so, much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Verse 22, we'll see the contrast now. But ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto a city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, into an innumerable company of angels. 
uh, I want to look at this, uh, starting kind of this topic off, uh, and, and look at that comparison made in verse 18 and verse 22 between the two mountains. And, and the first thing I want to cover tonight, uh, we're going to talk about heaven a little bit. Uh, and, of course, I'm glad this song came up and we sang about heaven. Uh, gets us in the mood to hear about heaven. Amen? And uh, looking forward to heaven. Uh, so I want to look, first of all, at heaven's location. Uh, heaven's location. Uh, of course, we, we, we typically would say, well, heaven, you know, it's up there, right? It's in the, it's in the stratosphere above the stratosphere, the one we can't see, you know, the, the heavens and then the heavens and then the heavens, you know, it's the third heaven. And, and, and you say that, that's all good and well, you know, past the, the skies that we can see, past the galaxies that we see, and what, that's all code and stuff, but, but you really can't wrap your mind around that, okay? Uh, heaven's location, we know this, uh, we know this, and this is enough for me, honestly. Heaven's location is just simply this, it's where Jesus is. It, wherever that may be, uh, however far away that might be, if it's in a galaxy far, far away, that's okay, okay, uh, because Jesus is there. And, and, of course, that's what we have built our lives around since we've been saved is getting, getting to realize the fact that one day we're going to go see him and get to meet him. So as we think about heaven's location and we think about these two mountains, I want to show you two things that are mentioned when we talk about these mountains. The first one is, is God's protection. Uh, God's protection. Uh, Mount Zion was one of the mountains uh, in the city of Jerusalem. Um, it was a stronghold of King David. It was actually the site where King David built his fortress. Uh, it was the strongest point in the city, and that's where David set up his domain, his territory, uh, his, his area, and it was a protective point. And, of course, you read as that passage of Scripture goes on, it's talking about Mount Zion, and it talks about how God protected that mountain, and at some point didn't want anything to touch it or it would die. Uh, and aren't you thankful that we have God's protection in our life? I know, you know, in heaven, obviously, there's nothing to protect us from, right? But even while we're here on earth, we have God's protection. Uh, just like they see this in Mount Zion, and they come up with these verses that say, you know, don't touch it, stay away. Moses thought about it and trembled when he thought about it. Uh, God's protection is evident in our life, is it not? Uh, God's protection is, is powerful in our lives. Uh, by the way, God's protection is needed in our lives. In, in, in everything that we have to face in our day-to-day -day lives, it's nice to know we have a God that cares. We have a God that's in control. And we have a God that has enough power to protect us from anything, anyone, or any situation you can throw at us. Uh, God's protection. And that's kind of the reference that's made when it talks about Mount Zion in verse 18 in those following verses. Uh, as you think about that, uh, you think about a second part of heaven's location. We'll get to Mount Zion or Mount Zion. Uh, you also then see God's presence. Uh, God's presence. I, I often say this when I talk about heaven. You know, uh, heaven to me is not the streets of gold and the walls of jasper and the gates of pearl and the, and the tree of life that bears chocolate chip cookies and peanut butter pies and bacon uh, and M&Ms and all that kind of thing. Uh, that's, not, that's all the backdrop of heaven, right? Heaven is seeing Jesus. You know, heaven is being in the presence of God. Uh, and that's what heaven is, all right? Uh, so if you really think about it, heaven's location is, is there for, for us when he calls us home. But if you really think about it, heaven's location in our lives is right now. We have his presence, do we not? We have his presence in our life. I know it doesn't compare to what we're going to get. Uh, it's not heaven on earth because I don't think there could be heaven on this earth. Amen. Uh, but we do experience his presence in our lives on a daily basis. Uh, God's presence. Uh, if you read about Mount Zion there uh, in verse number 22, it talks about how it's the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, and to an innumerable company of angels. This is God's dwelling place. This is God's dwelling place. It's not just a city. It's God's city. It's not just a place. It's God's place. Uh, this is the wonderful nature that we know about heaven. It's a place of God's presence. You remember as Israel traveled through the wilderness with the tabernacle, and every time they'd set it up and uh, worship and all those types of things, you know, God's presence went with them. And it was really kind of found in the Holy of Holies there in the tabernacle. Uh, of course, they built the temple, and they would go and worship God uh, and experience God's presence. Uh, we get to experience it on a daily basis. You know, ever since Jesus did what Jesus did for us on the cross, right, and gave us access to the Father, and the veil was rent in two, all, all, all that gives us access to having, having a, a relationship with God. So we get to experience God's presence, and that's what Mount Zion is referring to uh, in verse number 22. So heaven's location, uh, and again, I'm not talking about the physical location. Uh, we kind of have an idea, you know, in the sky, right? Uh, we, we could be wrong, who knows, but uh, we kind of have that indication. Uh, but really, if you think about God's or heaven's location, uh, we get to experience that daily in our Christian lives. 
Uh, we get to experience God's presence, God's power, God's protection, God's provision, all things that God does for us in our lives, we get to experience. Uh, and, and so uh, one day we'll get to experience that, of course, in, in the actual place called heaven, Mount Zion. Uh, so think about that. Look at, uh, look at verse number 22 again, and let's look at verse 22 and 23. Uh, but you're coming to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Uh, as you think about heaven's location, let's look at number two, and let's look at heaven's population. Uh, who's in heaven? What makes up the population of heaven? Of course, we've already referred to the fact that, you know, God is there. Jesus is there. That's the most important thing, right? Old and New Testament saints are there. Our loved ones who knew Christ when they died are there. Uh, uh, angels are there. Uh, so you think about the population of heaven. I think you see two references made in verse 22 and verse number 23. In verse number 22, first of all, you see the servants of God. Uh, you see an, 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 an an innumerable <laughs> company of angels. Sometimes that tongue just doesn't want to work. Uh, an innumerable company of angels. These are the servants of God. What are, the, what are the roles that angels play right now in our lives? Protection. Protection is the big one, right? Guidance. Uh, really, if you think about it, they, they, they're at God's beck and call. They're the servants of God. Just like we think Satan, you know, he has all of his demonic forces that, that, that play a role in our lives or in the world uh, for him. Christ has a, has a legion of, of angels, and they are set to do one thing, serve him. Serve him. And by serving him, if you really think about it, you know, it's taking place in heaven as well. But when you think about where we are, where we live, serving him means serving us. Serving him means protecting us. Serving him means working on our behalf in our lives. So the population of heaven starts with the servants of God. Uh, can you imagine what it's going to be like when we get to heaven? You know, the Bible says um, there's great rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repented. The, the angels rejoice, right? Can you imagine what it's going to be like when a million people show up in the portals of glory? Huh? Can you imagine... The, the, the sound, the noise, the triumph, the joy, the victory cry that's going to take place from the angels when we all get there. If they rejoice when we got saved here on earth, can you imagine rejoicing is going to take place when we all get to meet them in the sky? Uh, the servants of God are there. What a celebration is going to take place in heaven. Uh, what, a, what a joyous time is going to take place in heaven. I, I always say, you know, when we get to heaven, it's going to be, it's going to be singing, it's going to be praising, it's going to be smiling, it's going to be happiness. And, and we as Christians, especially Baptists, we need to work on some of that now. Amen? You're going to be smiling for a hundred years, a million years, a trillion years, right? You better work on it now. Amen? <laughs> Let your face know it's all right. You're going to be singing and praising God. We might as well practice now, all right? I, I want to fit in with that joyous chorus that takes place in heaven. Amen. For great rejoicing in heaven because the servants of God are there. Uh, the angels are mentioned in verse number 22. Verse number 23 gives us a little bit def, uh, different definition of the population of heaven. You see the saints of God are there. Verse number 23, it talks about the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. Uh, the saints of God. Uh, who are the saints of God? Lessons, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, again, I, I think I mentioned this at one point. It may have been a Wednesday night. It may have been a Sunday. I don't remember when it was. But a saint is not something, uh, a name that somebody has earned. And I know that the Catholic Church kind of does some of those sainthoods are, are given to certain. That's not what a saint is, okay? We need to understand that. A saint is a born-again child of God. So you're saved, you're a saint. Now, you don't act like it sometimes, amen? Neither do I. I get that. Uh, but we're referred to as a saint, okay, if we're saved. So the saint of God uh, is, is a child of God. Uh, I love the phrase in, in verse number 23. Uh, it uses the, the word firstborn. You realize that the redeemed, born-again child of God is called firstborn? That's what we're called. That's how we're referenced. In Christ, uh, all that he is, we are. What God sees in his son Jesus he sees in us. Why? Because he sees Christ. Uh, so, you know, the Bible uses that word joint heirs. 
We're joint heirs with Christ. Uh, we're part of the family uh, of God through Christ. Uh, so, so we're called firstborn. How many of you are firstborn in your family? All right. So how many of you are middle child? How many babies we got? Aw, oh, didn't we go babies? Let me see the middle children again. How many middle children we got? Boy, weren't we oppressed and afflicted? Wasn't life hard? The older, you know, the older child, you know, got everything. Yeah, what's that? The older child always belly aching. <laughs> oh, you're saying the middle child? I see you here. Older child, you know, baby got away with everything, and the middle child got blamed for everything. We were stuck in the. It was horrible. But I'm kidding. <laughs> we should have a, 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 a re, we should seek reparations. What do you think? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Firstborn. Firstborn has its privileges. Right? Firstborn has different responsibilities than the baby does. Uh, firstborn has different benefits. Especially, especially if you think about during, during Bible days. That firstborn child, that was a blessing to be the firstborn. Esau messed it up when he traded that firstborn right for, you know, with, with Jacob for that potted, the bowl of pottage, red bowl of soup. He messed up. Being a firstborn, that's a big deal. And by the way, even today, you know, it might not be like it was in the Bible days, but generally, as long as the firstborn has somewhat of a head on his shoulders, uh, many times as the parents uh, get older and age and that kind of thing, that firstborn is the one that kind of comes in and kind of takes over the affairs, kind of get, keeps things going in many cases. Um, the inheritance might not be the same like it was back in those days. We know that. But there's still a lot of responsibility and a lot of benefits even today of being the firstborn. Think about this. We're not being called the firstborn of physical parents here. We're being called the firstborn of God the Father. <laughs> that's some pretty good benefits, isn't it? I think so. I think that's got a pretty good benefit package with it. However, let's also remember now, because we're living here in this day and age, that also comes with some responsibilities. Okay? Uh, so don't, don't try to worm out of being the firstborn. We're thankful for it. We're looking forward to the benefits. But let's make sure we fulfill our role here on earth. Uh, as the firstborn. So the saints of God are mentioned in verse number 23. Uh, the redeemed are called firstborn. In Christ we are and have all that he has. Uh, this is the place where the Old and New Testament Christians will be. This is the place where, uh, you know, you can sit down with Jonah and talk about what it was like in the, in, in the stomach of the great fish. He, he can probably tell you exactly what kind of fish it was. There might be speculation today and people might say, well, we think it, it could have been this and it could have been that. Uh, Jonah can say, no, let me tell you exactly what it was. It was a, it was a uh, uh, what's, that, what's that trashy fish? Uh, carp. It was a giant carp. <laughs> Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> but anyways, uh, you know, you can sit down and talk with David. And you can sit down and talk with Paul. Uh, you can sit down and talk with Stephen and ask him what it was like uh, when Jesus stood up to receive him into heaven and into the portals of glory when he was stoned as the first martyr. We can talk to all those. That's where they are. Now, now if you think about that, uh, let's not stop there. I don't have this on your outline, but don't stop there. That's also where our loved ones are that died in Christ. If you've lost a family member, a husband, a, a wife, a mother, a father, a child, uh, uh, an uncle, a cousin, whatever, you can fill in any blank, all right? If you've lost a person who knew Christ as their Savior, guess what? This is where they are. They're making up the population of heaven that, that we'll get to join when it's our turn to either be called home or to be raptured, either way. Uh, so so the, the, the redeemed, uh, that, that's us. The Old and New Testament saints are there. Uh, our, our loved ones who have died and gone before are all there. That's the population of heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but getting to see Jesus is, of course, first and foremost, right? But can you imagine what it's going to be like when we get to heaven with everything else going on? Seeing the angels, uh, seeing these, 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 these men and women of the faith that we read about and preach about and teach about and talk about all the time. Uh, seeing loved ones uh, that we've been missing for so many years. The great reunion is going to take place. Uh, that's the population of heaven. And again, as we get older, I think the more we start to appreciate and really think about how sweet heaven's going to be. I think we start to focus and hone in on a little bit more about, man, heaven's going to be an enjoyable place. And I can't, I can't wait to get there. Amen. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily begging to die, but I'm, I'm ready to go. Amen. Uh, aren't you thankful as a child of God we don't have to fear death? You know, we don't have to fear what's going to happen uh, when we die. We don't have to fear what's next. In the, what's gonna, am I going to be reborn as a cat? 
God is not that mean. Let me just say that, all right? Whatever the case, right? Uh, we don't have to worry about that. We know according to Scripture what's going to happen when we die. And to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we understand that. And we're thankful for that. The population of heaven. One day, you and I will join the population of heaven. Uh, and again, when we do, can you imagine the joy and the excitement and the thrill that's going to take place in our lives at that particular moment? What an awesome day. What an awesome day it's going to be. So we see, uh, we see heaven's location. We see heaven's population. And then if you look back at verse number 24, let's read verse 24. And we'll give this last thought. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Uh, this is the change between Old Testament sacrifice by the priest. He only had access to the Holy of Holy, right? This is the change. This is the new covenant. Now Jesus came. A sprinkling of blood. Jesus came down on the cross to establish the fact that we now have access to the Father. Okay, so that's a new covenant. Uh, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. And, of course, we remember the sacrifice that Abel made in the, in, the, in the book of Genesis when God asked for that spotless lamb and the blood to be shed, and Abel did exactly what he was supposed to do. And God was pleased. God accepted that sacrifice, and then Cain got mad and killed him, all right? And you say, well, that wasn't fair. Well, that's what happened. Uh, but, but, but what we see here is Jesus, the mediator, this, this instigator, if you will, this initiator of the new covenant, the go-between between between us and God, shed his blood so that we can have access to the Father. And what the scripture teaches, verse number 24, is that's better than what happened with Abel. Now, Abel was thrilled that God accepted the sacrifice, I'm sure, right? Now, the end result, Abel not, may not have been thrilled with, although he got to go be with God, so... I guess that was a thrilling thing. But you, know, you might read that story at surface and say, well, he, that was a bad, bad gig for him, bad deal for him. He got to be with Jesus, all right? Uh, and so we, we, we have to understand that what God did for us through his son Jesus Christ on Calvary uh, makes heaven an enjoyable place. It makes it better uh, than any sacrifice that was offered in the Old Testament. Uh, we've been reading and studying through the entire book of Hebrews about Jesus is better. Jesus is greater, uh, high priest, greater sacrifice, all those things we've seen. And now you kind of see it coming to fruition as we get to heaven. Uh, the blood of the sprinkling, the new covenant is better than anything that took place in the Old Testament in all those sacrifices that was made. So number three, uh, number three, we see heaven's jubilation. We ha see heaven's jubilation. Uh, this is the excitement, the joy, the thrill that we're going to experience when we get to see Jesus. Jubilation. You ever had jubilation? Yes? <laughs> Probably a lot of different people in this room, a lot of different reasons, a lot of different areas of life, you experienced something and said, that was, that was just pure joy. I was, I was over-thrilled and over-excited about that. It was a wonderful thing. You know, maybe you met somebody that you always wanted to meet. Maybe you experienced peanut butter pie for the first time. Maybe you got a gift card for 600 pounds of bacon. You know, I, I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> new car, new home, whatever. Spouse, getting married, whatever. That day you got married. That day you had your first child. Uh, that, that extreme amount of jubilation. You know what? That doesn't hold a candle compared to what it's going to be like when we step into the portals of glory. When we step into heaven, into the presence of God, you talk about an excitement that's going to take place. You know, you think... <laughs> You think Baptists can't shout? <laughs> They're coming a day, brother. <laughs> where the Baptists going to be shouting with the Pentecostals, amen? Because here, here's the thing about heaven. There ain't no denominations in heaven. Amen? I don't care what your religious background is. I don't care what church you were brought up in. I don't care what, you know, what differences there are in this room and in other churches. That, none of that matters. Because who's in heaven are going to be the children of God. Save people. And by the way, just so that we're all clear and we all understand something, um, it's not going to be just Baptists in heaven. We need, to, we need to make sure we understand that, okay? Because some of you would be in trouble. Amen? Because you weren't brought up Baptist, right? There ain't going to be just Baptists in heaven, okay? There's going to be a bunch of saved people in heaven. Matter of fact, I'm going to go as far as to say there ain't going to be any Baptists in heaven. There ain't going to be any Pentecostals. There ain't going to be any Lutherans. There ain't going to be any Methodists in heaven. There are going to be a bunch of saved people in heaven. Amen? And what an exciting time. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine? I, I don't know how many people are saved. I know the Bible says, you know, narrow is the way. Few there be that find it, okay? In a population of our world of almost 8 billion people, if, if, if let's say a billion make it to heaven, an eighth of the population, let's just say, okay? Can you imagine if a billion people in the portals of glory all getting along at the same time? 
not arguing about, well, I think the Bible says this. Well, I think it says this. Well, you're wrong. No, I'm right. Huh? Having the mind of Christ in, in, in one unified body. <laughs> you talk about church, brother. <laughs> it's going to be an awesome day. It's going to be an awesome time. It's going to be an awesome couple million years as we just worship and celebrate and love Jesus and actually get along. Amen? <laughs> and praise and sing and shout and, and just have, a, have, have a, a time of jubilation in heaven. Uh, you think about this jubilation. Why, why the excitement? Why is this such a time of, wow, this is going to be great. Why do we look at this and say, man, we can't wait. I, I put down two thoughts. First of all, think about this. It's going to be an exciting time, and we think about it this way, because of Christ's continual work. Do you realize that one of the ministries of Christ in our life is intercessory prayer? Uh, just like that priest was the go-between uh, between God and man, Jesus is our go-between. And, and when I pray, you know what Jesus does? I don't like this sometimes because that's like, well, that's not what I asked for. Jesus, Jesus hears my prayer and says, that's not what you need. What you really need is this. And he goes to God and says, hey, God, he's asking for this. I, I didn't ask for that. But God knows what I need. Jesus knows what I need. And so as my intercessor, if you will, my go-between, my, 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 the one who stands on my behalf, right? He says, this is what he really needs, God. That's what you need to give him. And have you ever noticed that sometimes you get your prayers answered, but you don't realize they're, they're answered because that's not what you were asking for, but that's what you needed. You ever been there? I don't like it. I pray for more money and God takes my job away. Teach me to live by faith, right? <laughs> We've all been there. So, so the continual work of Christ is this. He's constantly interceding on our behalf. Constantly. Daily. Uh, more than several times a day. He's interceding on our behalf. He's constantly making the fact that I am saved and a child of God valid. I have access to God because of Jesus. My prayers are answered because of Jesus. I get his mercies new every morning because of Jesus. So his continual work in my life validates my salvation. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> it's, it's nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with my religion or my church or, again, my denominational background. It's all Jesus. And so his continual work in my life uh, is one reason why I stay excited about the fact that I get to go to heaven. I get to see Jesus. I get to experience all that the Bible talks about in the little bit that it talks about about heaven. You know, we, we don't know. The half has not been told, okay? We don't know what heaven's going to hold in store for us. We got just enough to scratch the surface and whet the appetite, right? Uh, can you imagine how awesome it's going to be? And it just makes it continually uh, enjoyable to think about, exciting to think about, because Christ continually works in my life until I get to heaven. Christ's continual work makes heaven's jubilation. Secondly, uh, another thought about it is, is Christ's completed work. Besides the fact that he's daily interceding for me and working on my behalf, in the, in, in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we find cleansing, we find forgiveness, we find healing, we find power, we find love, we find grace, we find mercy. All because of what Christ has done for us. You realize that religion is all about do? Christianity, salvation, true salvation, is all about done. Jesus took care of it all. I'm excited about heaven because Jesus is the one that paved the way. Jesus is the one that made it possible. Jesus is the one because of what he did said, all you do is accept what I've done and nothing else. And because of that, heaven's an exciting place to look forward to. And then on top of that, he continues to work and minister and intercede and bless on my behalf. What an awesome Savior we have, amen? <laughs> Heaven's jubilation. If you've never been excited about anything in your life, you ought to be excited about the fact that heaven's your eternal home. If nothing can make you, 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 you praise the Lord and shout and get to a time where you're just having a little fit, heaven ought to do that. Heaven ought to do Because if you really think about it, and it really boils down to this, and I know this is a Wednesday night crowd, so you're all going to agree with me, none of us deserve it. None of us have or can earn it. Amen? It's all because of what Christ has done. That's what makes it even more exciting. Isn't it nice to get something in the mail that said, 
you've been, you've been, uh, uh, somebody has donated $10,000 to you. And it wasn't one of the guys from Africa, you know, that wants you to, some rich prince, you know. But a legitimate, hey, a relative, you know, sent you, and, and, and you got a, a pile of money that you did nothing to earn. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? You, you, well, you'd tell everybody, you'd be praising the Lord every Wednesday night for the rest of the year. I got to praise. <laughs> you already said that. I know, but I'm still excited about it, right? <laughs> Think about it. Think about all that we have been given to us and is continually given to us by Jesus Christ, and we didn't deserve or do anything for any of it. That's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. Heaven's jubilation. Uh, we understand the location, and we see the, the protection and the presence of God. Uh, the population, it's great. It's going to be even greater. The jubilation. The excitement of what awaits. The excitement of what's to come because of Jesus Christ. Not because of you. Not because of me. Not because of religion. Because of Jesus Christ. What an awesome, awesome, awesome thing that awaits us in this place called heaven. Next week, we're going to pick up at verse 25. We're going to finish the chapter. Woo! Only one to go. Uh, we'll finish the chapter. And we're going to look at the topic of he that speaks from heaven. He that speaks from heaven. And we'll finish up those last few verses and conclude chapter 12, only leaving one more chapter. Are you getting excited? Are we going to be done by the first of the year? Maybe. <laughs> what year, right? I think I have uh, the last chapter broken down already into about three, paths, three, three lessons, I think. So I think we have four more. Uh, do I, have, I had it on my, I don't even remember. Is it about four more? So I think I have about four more. So we won't finish by the first year, will we? Well, yeah, then we have four Wednesdays in December. We will. Wow, woo! We will finish it by 2024. That's exciting. Anyway, so that's where we'll be next week. And you can read those again. Just a handful of verses. You can read those ahead if you'd like. And that's where we'll pick up next week. All right, let's pray together. We'll see if there's any comments or questions. Uh, and then we'll uh, head out tonight. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for heaven. And Lord, we thank you that... Uh, uh, as we age, Lord, and as we mature even in our Christianity, we understand the sweetness of heaven. Lord, we understand how, how much it seems like even daily it becomes greater and more wonderful. And Lord, our anticipation builds as we think about the prospects of, of seeing Christ face to face in this place called heaven. Uh, Lord, I pray that we will live our lives in light uh, of the fact that we are going to heaven and it's such a wonderful place. We want to bring as many people along with us. And we'll be witnesses, Lord, and share uh, the gospel with as many people as we possibly can, Lord, until you call us home. Help us, Lord, this week even to, uh, to meet with people, Lord. Bring them into our pathways. Uh, give us some divine appointments, Lord, to give us opportunity to share the gospel with people. And may we take advantage of those appointments, Lord, and, and truly be a witness for Christ. Help us to live for you. Help us to, to love people. Help us to invest in lives. And Lord, may we be all that we need to be for the cause of Christ because of what he's done for us. May we live for him, Lord, I pray. Father, we ask now tonight as we go to our homes, give us safety, please, as we travel. Uh, bless the festivities uh, that are taking place this week, Lord. The uh, baby shower going on, Lord. Uh, uh, church service Sunday, funeral on Monday. Lord, we just ask you to meet uh, with everything that takes place, Lord, and bless us. And uh, may we lift you up and draw all men to the Savior, Lord, we pray. We thank you again for tonight. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your, your uh, abundant mercy and grace in our lives. And Lord, may we never lose sight of the beauty and the wonder and the excitement of our eternal home called heaven, Lord, I pray. We thank you again now for all you've done. And we ask for your continued blessings. And we thank you in advance for working in our lives. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. We get all our blanks filled in tonight? <laughs>